those of you who don't know, this is the education seminar at South Asia Institute, and I'm Akshay Mangla. I'm a new professor at the business school, and uh, we're very, very fortunate today uh, to have a, uh, a very senior official from India who's now working in Beijing in uh, the UNESCO office, um, Mr. Abhiman Yu Singh, and I'll just tell you a bit about him. Uh, He's currently the director of the UNESCO office in Beijing and UNESCO representative to the PRC, DRK, Japan, Mongolia, and the Republic of Korea. From 2006 to 2008, Mr. Singh served as director of the UNESCO office in Abuja, Nigeria. From 2001 to 6, he led the global coordination and monitoring of the Education for All movement at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. And from 74 to 2000, he was a member of the Indian Administrative Service. This is the, the premier civil service of India. And in that, uh, in that service, he held key positions at various levels of national and provincial governments, including uh, Secretary of Education in the state of Rajasthan, which is very interesting. He shared, the, he shared the Global Drafting Committee. He chaired the Global Drafting Committee at the World Education Forum in Dakar in 2000. And as a mid-career professional, he was a Hubert Humphrey Fellow at the University of Pittsburgh. So uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Singh, and we'll have him speak on the comparison between education for all in India and China. Thank you, Akshay, and thank you all of you for turning up here uh, at your lunchtime. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> I should express my gratitude to the South Asia Initiative and the Harvard Asia Center, and of course, Akshay, for agreeing to chair the, and co-sponsor this event. Uh, I uh, will talk as a practitioner, not as a theorist, based on my experience in India and China, and the subject that I have chosen to speak on is of my own volition and interest. I am not necessarily an expert in it, though I worked long years in education in India. My experience in China uh, with education has to be shared with five other sectors of uh, UNESCO and four other countries. But nevertheless, we will take a look very quickly uh, at uh, where these two countries started from and where they are and how they got there and what are the implications of their experiences. Uh, education for all, what EFA stands for, is a global movement which has six goals right now. We'll have others after 2015. But we will concentrate only on two of the major goals. That's universal primary education and adult literacy, which really are the pillars of uh, this movement and uh, time perhaps will not allow for discussion on the other goals, but we will, uh, we can cover those um, uh, in, in the question and, and answer sessions. So allow me to go pretty quickly through this, but uh, it will take about 45 minutes or so and then we can uh, discuss. So this is just to so say that the adult illiterate population in the world is still staggering and is a cause of grave concern to those of us who work in this uh, arena. And you would see that the adult illiterates uh, will still be about 800 million in 2015, which is our target date. And India and China, which have 50 percent of these uh, in 2000, will still have 45 percent. And the onus, of course, there is on these countries, but particularly on India, to get their act together. Uh, one of the consequences of EFA becoming a global movement is that uh, you are no longer on your own, but you're also expo ex uh, exposed uh, uh, every year through monitoring to, to, in to, international, uh, to the international glare, if one might say so. So uh, that is the picture in adult literacy above 15 years. And if you look at China and India, you already see that from 1990, China has made enormous progress, the red graph, and has what you may call only residual adult illiteracy, whereas India, despite making huge progress in terms of proportion of adult literates, which is ab about 75 percent now, still has a huge number because their population keeps increasing. Uh, so here you have see, uh, you see a dimension of um, uh, development which which is interlinked, uh, you know, but it, but is not entirely uh, clear when you just see this this chart. So I think one has to see how demographics uh, play a major role, and also you saw in the last chart that 
if you have a higher, higher population as those uh, 10 countries have, uh, you have a higher degree of difficulty in achieving uh, literacy and education goals. So we start in the late 40s when both countries uh, uh, became sovereign republics. India, after 200 years of British colonial rule following a turbulent independence struggle and equally China from extreme social and economic turmoil over 100 years, which they still remember as the century of humiliation. What it did to education systems is to leave them in complete disarray. Uh, in India, before the British came, uh, there was a well-established indigenous village-based education system, which was uprooted and could never <coughs> be substituted adequately through a centralized public education system inspired by alien model from UK and Europe and designed to serve the needs of the empire rather than the, the masses. And if you want to have a good idea of what the system was, how it functioned, uh, I would uh, uh, refer you to Dharampal's beautiful tree. Uh, the title of which has been appropriate by James Tooley also. So there are two books now called Beautiful Tree. But I think James Tooley also gives a very good summary of uh, how this system was functioning and how it actually influenced the European system rather than the other way around, but was a complete disaster for, for India. Uh, China also had a, a semi-feudal, semi-colonial <coughs> situation where the mission to educate the masses really fell on the People's Republic in 1949. So you have a small schooled elite which is uh, <coughs> mostly ruling the country and unlettered and poor masses, especially women, uh, at the beginning of the, the journey. And then we take you to 1990 as a snapshot. Uh, we need not go into these figures. All that they say is China got its act together very quickly and uh, their enrollment in primary school, the adult literacy rates, number of adult illiterates all uh, <coughs> looked better, much better than they were in 1949. So much so that they had three quarters of their children in school uh, by 1990, a fact which most people, uh, many people do not quite acknowledge. And that uh, in India it was just half. So you see that the uh, in a sense, the race race was uh, is not really competitive after that, if if you can call that. So let's see what uh, how this happened. So he's saying China's rapid progress, India's relatively slower progress. Uh, China's first interim constitutions talked about not only the right but the obligation of adults to education. Adults. Uh, India still does not have any provision in constitution making uh, education a right for adults. It does for children up to 14 years of age. Uh, the first school system, in fact, was kicked off within three months of the republic being established, based on Soviet experience, but adapted to the Chinese experience and focusing really strongly on workers and farmers. So what you see is China has made a radical break from the past. And uh, their literacy, their adult education programs, their vocational education, still very much focused on the three pillars of the communist system, uh, which are workers, farmers, and soldiers. And the local communities were asked to pick up the tag because the government was extremely poor at that time. And gradually, when things became better, you had the walking on two legs, which balanced the responsibility for schooling between Gongban, government schools, and community schools called Minban. And that has remained the pattern now, uh, of course, more or less switching to government, but still with a lot of support from the <coughs> communities. And as early as 52, having a, a grant system for the poor students, a trend which still has become stronger uh, and helps uh, a lot of the disadvantaged uh, population. So the egalitarian uh, basis is well established. A uh, very pragmatic approach by China, If you, the characters in Chinese, I, are horrendously difficult to learn, and too many. So they adopted this pinyin, which is a simplified Chinese characters, uh, to reduce the burden of learning, again focusing on peasants and farmers. They realized that uh, they will not be able to <coughs> become what, what are called new Chinese citizens with the revolutionary fervor, the ideological, uh, you know, training, etc., without learning the language. And so they, they have actually changed the language, and this is called pinyin. 
the learning materials and community te teachers were were all trained in this uh, in this language also on the basis of Soviet textbooks which suited the Chinese situation. And very quickly the social responsibility for education was accepted that is not only government but factory run primary schools, agricultural communes uh, and everybody really pitching in with night schools, with part time schools, with winter literacy classes suited to the life and rhythm of the rural community. Uh, very much as I say focused on those who had been left out by the system for centuries. Uh, pragmatic approach, uh, not everybody sought to be educated at the same level at the same time, but moving from the economically uh, better off states to the less uh, backward, to the more backward, sorry. And then in 1986, uh, they consolidated this through a law, which basically um, <coughs> brought in those who had been left out, contained the dropouts, but made education really free and compulsory for nine years with state guarantee of funds, a firm legal basis, uh, decentralized management and funding, which are very clear cut responsibilities saying that local governments are squarely responsible for adult literacy and basic education, and they will have to raise funds through taxes and whatever for it. It has implications both ways, but it was done in, in the initial stages. And the balanced development now uh, came into play because it was realized that some parts, eastern parts, are very much ahead of the others. So there is this partnership where the more developed parts help the less developed parts very specifically. And of course, uh, strong emphasis on equity, which still is there and is a challenge for the future, ethnic minorities, poor, disabled, and increasingly urban migrants. So in 1980, actually, before the law reform and opening up in the early 80s, you already have a critical mass of educated and skilled labor for agriculture, industry, and urbanization. So it could be said that there would be no Deng Xiaoping without Mao Zedong. <coughs> People, I think, don't quite rec recognize this uh, foundation also. And then, of course, there are these disparities which persist, uh, but they are narrowing down. Uh, and the universal of primary education, adult literacy, and vocational education all are seen as part of the same uh, strategy, not, not distinctive, um, you know, as you see in many developing countries. It helps to see them as all going in the same direction, complementing each other. India started with uh, uh, no fundamental right to education. Let's say it that way. It had free and compulsory education up to 14 years in the directive principles, which are not justiciable, which are not uh, challengeable in court, but provide direction to the state. Uh, and that direction was un unfortunately not followed within 10 years. We didn't get there. And in fact, we are still not there. The Gandhi's, Gandhi's vision of basic education was accepted as a policy, but neither implemented nor explicitly rejected until 60s, which means about 30 years you had this uh, anomalous situation, which way to go. And uh, I, will, I can go into the details later, but it is interesting as to how uh, that was really, I think, a missed opportunity by the Indian leadership in not being able to uh, give a clear steer and direction as to where we want to go. No break here, no break from the past, just lateral expansion of what existed. And a lot of focus on um, the other levels of education instead of basic education, namely, higher education, science and technology, and the professionals. Uh, nevertheless, some new schemes were launched in 1976 when state was moved from the state, uh, the education was moved from the state to the, to the concurrent list, which means both provinces and central government can legislate. So center took on a more activist role. All these programs were launched. Unfortunately, neither, none of them were quite sustained in the long term. So you see a wavering political commitment uh, and of course, in India, non-state actors play a huge role, uh, including social and religious organizations and their contribution, I think, whatever we say about the state uh, ha has to be underlined and kept, kept in mind. And I think this is one of the strengths of the Indian system. So uh, they say that you, you reap what you sow. So uh, India had uh, these benefits from investing in higher levels of education. But if you look at the bottom, slow and very gradual improvement in access to primary school, adult literacy, and the narrowing of disparities between urban and rural areas, between the uh, 
boys and girls between the lower social classes and the higher classes didn't quite happen as, as, as it did in China. So you have an elitist and urban bias in the education system and if you want to read more on that, I think Myron Wiener from MIT in his book The State and the Child in India has given a classic uh, description of why this is so. No uh, enforcement of compulsory education laws and no enforcement of laws prohibiting child labor and all kinds of uh, attitudes which justified this situation as one which was um, historically uh, prevalent, socially necessary and so on. So th those are very uh, interesting issues which we can also discuss but again I think he's, uh, he's on the ball and that book I hope did make some difference to policy. Uh, so you had large number of adult illiterates, particularly among women, lower caste, tribal population and minorities and its situation start changing only after India opens up in 1991, has a new policy in 1986 and the level of learning in schools was a problem and is still a huge problem as Lan Pritchett points out in his latest books and so do uh, Drez and Sen in, in their latest book, uh, The Uncertain Glory. Oh, no, not uncertain. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so policy uh, in 1986 with which I was personally associated, so we keep saying, oh, we, we were the turning point. Uh, and it shifted government priorities hugely from higher education to primary education and adult literacy. The National Literacy Mission was launched for the first time in 1989 after the early, earlier failure. Finances and organizational support was provided to disadvantaged groups, particularly through non-formal education and other centrally, what were called centrally sponsored schemes, also raising quality, but maintaining the uh, emphasis on secularism and science. Again, for Indians, I think this is extremely important that these important legacies were preserved and promoted, but I think also a nudge to privatization realizing that the state probably had too, too big a task here on hand. But partnership with civil society, particularly after 86, you find them proliferating and um, uh, contributing a huge um, amount of progress in the, in the backward uh, areas. So we come to 1990, uh, it's a kind of break between the two parts of the presentation and we have a global EFA movement launched and six goals at Dakar. Uh, two of these became MDGs, but I, the last, I think, bottom part is more important countries being held to account here uh, of uh, progress or lack of it, also donors uh, for what they were doing, and an educational index to measure and rate performance of countries on which China has done very well, India has done fairly well, and then a f compact for funding uh, where richer countries uh, pledged funding to the poorer countries who had a deficit. <coughs> so coming to post EFA, China you could see consolidated and moved on uh, by universalizing nine-year compulsory basic education and eradicating illiteracy among young and middle-aged people. Now you see the very concrete use of words by China, young and middle-aged people. In India you don't find this, it's a bit fuzzy. So people question why you are making 80-year-olds literates instead of 5-year-olds. In China, they say, no, our target is young, which is up to 25, and middle age, which is up to 40. And that is, that is our policy target in focus. And, and above that, they have other means of educating people, uh, but uh, it's not a part of this uh, particular strategy. And then they realize that the cost of education, particularly in the backward areas, was a huge constraint, there were a huge uh, number of people dropping, uh, children dropping out, not coming to school in the western areas. So they went for abolition of fees, textbook subsidies, and 7,700 boarding schools, which still exist. You don't get too much of a peek into it, but one hears that the experience is mixed. There are problems, uh, children are too small to be separated from their families, issues of health, heating, hygiene and too much pressure on teachers who really have to be caretakers as well 24-7. So there are issues, but this is their strategy to say we can't possibly provide physical access in, in the terrain that we have. And so we uh, try to bring the children to school and 
send them back on the weekends or, or after some short. Now they have a new policy, 2010-2020, uh, which is integrated into the five-year plans. Uh, and I think the focus here is on the two squares in the middle, equity and quality. This is really what they are trying to do. And modernization uh, is their way of trying to say that we will now modernize our system and bring it to world class. So it will not only be the largest system, it will be one of the best systems. And of course, best means equating it with countries like the US, <laughs> whether the Americans are, are uh, convinced that they have the best system or not is <laughs> a different matter. But Chinese very much um, uh, lining themselves up with the, with the developed countries now. Uh, these are challenges, uh, I've just listed them, but I think again two issues which come to mind. One is urban migrants, 300 million people migrating from rural to urban areas. There are 80% uh, have been provided for public education, but there are issues there which need to be uh, sorted out. Ethnic minorities, if you, the issue of bilingual and multilingual education and culturally appropriate education is an issue there. And these will resonate, I think, with many other developing countries. And at the, uh, at the bottom, you say now China opening up the education system to civil society, private sector. Uh, India, back to India. Uh, sorry, it's, this is a bit confusing, but we thought we'll stop at 1990 and then see. So India really got its act together, I think, in, in 1990 to 2000. Uh, massive total literacy campaigns on the shoulders of 10 million vol unpaid volunteers. Uh, Midday meals in primary schools in the mid-90s. I was at the, in the ministry and this scheme was my responsibility. A lot of headaches, but then the Supreme Court, you know, the judicial activism in India has played a role, said that we should move from distribution of food grains to hot cooked meals and that has uh, work. Non-formal education is something we ought to discuss separately. India is perhaps the only country which has non-formal education for 6 to 14 years. When you talk about non-formal in other international fora, you will talk about adult and non-formal education. In India, non-formal education is meant for school children who cannot make it to school in the day. I'll just say that and leave it open because it's controversial, it is not fully accepted and yet it is necessary. And then India first time, I think China never did this, opened itself for external financial assistance in the 90s after a huge debate internally as if we were selling the soul of the country, but uh, through the World Bank and so on. It was very serious uh, with very uh, interesting debates. But finally, the district primary education program from World Bank and some other programs like Lok Jumbish, Shiksha Karmi, uh, these are people's movement, para teachers, community schools all coming through. Uh, showing that innovation is easier probably to do uh, and weave into the system if there are foreign backers, even if they have you know, not so much funding. So decentralization, micro planning and community engagement then become uh, strategies uh, promoted through this but uh, adapted uh, by all states. Then another phase now after 2000 where there has been this progressive legislation, education has actually been a funda become a fundamental right. I was privileged to, to be able to be in the group that drafted this. Um, so we keep saying all, all the mistakes are ours, but uh, <laughs> at least it happened. And then early childhood care and education got into the constitution, which itself is a major achievement. And then you have a follow-up legislation. But most importantly, I think the last part uh, I think this has revolutionary potential in an India which is stable but moves slowly. Uh, quota of 25 seats for poorer section in private schools now. Uh, very um, interesting, extremely difficult to implement, uh, but uh, at least a step in the right direction. And so India had 52% literacy in 91, uh, over seven years, so it became 74%, which is tremendous for a huge population, mainly through the total literacy campaigns, but those are good at um, uh, social mobilization of volunteers and uh, short-term literacy, but not so good in retention of literacy. 
out of school children have gone down dramatically from 20 million to 2.3. But there are figures which say that as many as 14 million children do not attend school regularly and that is the beginning of the problem of dropout. So they may be registered and enrolled but they don't often come to school for a huge variety of reasons and then uh, they become vulnerable. The no net enrollment rate has almost touched 100 which is impressive. Uh, the gender gaps have narrowed. Now India says that we have as many girls, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes in schools as the proportion of their population. Not bad. Uh, but there are a whole lot of issues surrounding those achievements. School infrastructure de is definitely better but not, not good enough by international standards. And then you have enhanced investments through an EFA kind of national scheme called Sarva Shiksha Abhyan, on which Akshay is the expert, so I leave it to you to <laughs> say things. But also some examples of interesting uh, innovative funding. Uh, I was in Nigeria where they had an education cess on uh, corporate tax, uh, which uh, unfortunately they wasted uh, on, on infrastructure and buying equipment and all, which was subject to a lot of leakage. But India has raised education says 1% on income tax, everybody's, 2% for secondary education and used it well, I think, by targeting it to girls and disadvantaged sections. And then again, gone in for, at least in the last four years, $1 billion of funding from World Bank, EU and DFID. So uh, I think that, that should be commended. Now, so, so what is the end result? Unfortunately, very good for China. Fortunately, sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, not so good for India. And the interesting figure is 1991, India has 287 million adult illiterates and the figure is the same in 2010. And that looks really odd, but that is because the population keeps increasing. But the, the differential, you see the differential in female uh, illiterates and, and male illiterates, and that is almost uh, extinguished in China, but still uh, 100 million. And if you see in proportion, I say the most staggering figure, which is not mentioned here, uh, is about uh, rural female adult literacy, China 87, India 47. Uh, percentage point difference of a staggering uh, 40 percent. This is also interesting, the, this is the provincial adult literacy rates uh, in, um, in China. Uh, if you s basically, Beijing has the highest literacy and uh, Tibet has the lowest. This is the illiteracy rate of adults and you'll see that the difference, if you discount Tibet, which we will not, not discuss, it is less than 10 between the lowest province and the highest province, less than 10 percent. And then you look at India. Uh, less, the difference between the highest uh, and the lowest is almost 50 percent. And another interesting finding is that the top 10 are all small states. So an argument for small educational states, smaller educational districts uh, is building its, itself up naturally. And if you look at the bottom, the surprises are the south, in, south of India, which is supposed to be more literate than the north, has two major states at the bottom of the list, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. And another figure which is astounding is that if you, if you look at Tibet as an aberration in the, in the last slide, uh, let me go back to it, 32% uh, of the population is illiterate and you, you, you think, oh, this is terrible and let's look at India. How many above 32? And I think if you talk in India, nobody will agree with you if you say Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh are less literate than Tibet. But they are. And if you look at female illiteracy, it will become worse. And then another situation which keeps coming up is that the bottom of the chart have the usual culprits from the Hindi-speaking states. You have Bihar, Jharkhand, Rajasthan, etc. But Jammu and Kashmir does pretty well. That is, uh, so there are, there are interesting things here which one needs to study. But basically, you cannot have this kind of situation in any country. And they were, there are issues which we'll now take up in the last three slides about this. So what happens, my, these are my insights. They may not be subject to empirical evidence. 
Uh, but uh, I'll just finish with these three, I think three or four slides. We, I think we are within time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at China, you are really impressed. I've been there for five years and I studied Chinese history also. Uh, the commitment to education is extremely high. Uh, it is a matter of national pride, international image, and the ambition to develop a world-class education system by 2020, which is second to none. In India, you don't find that so, so explicitly. Uh, China is very conscious, uh, so is India, but China is conscious in a different way of the century of humiliation and wants to uh, really uh, prevent a situation that, that allows that to happen again. So it's a constant reminder, the price of not being vigilant and united and therefore really focusing on the basics of development like education. In India, the colonial rule is still, I feel, uh, you know, nebulous, its re reaction to it. It has changed, but still we many times use it as an alibi for non-performance. And, and people are now asking, so how long will you do that? So uh, it, it's not a stimulus for action as it is in, in, in China. And in China, the high price of losing face, you know, the Chengdu mask, uh, if you've seen the Chengdu mask performers who keep changing face, but changing face is okay, but losing face is just unacceptable. And, and therefore, the Chinese really put in a lot of effort to make sure that the policies are implemented and, and seen, seen as successful. I think we have um, moved beyond the stage in which Chinese uh, statistics are no longer seen to be credible. People accept the achievements, they want to know how uh, they, they did it. And you see this provincial leaders having a very good grasp of what they are doing to eradicate poverty, what they are doing to increase GNP, and what they are doing to improve situation in education, health, infrastructure. So uh, I think that performance-based incentive system is, is, uh, is working. Uh, in India, issues of accountability are diffused and lost in passing the buck between the ruling party and the opposition, between the center and the state, between the media and whoever. And, and the outcomes of election, which is a which is supposed to be an instrument of accountability, in most cases is not linked to development performance. There are all kinds of issues which come in. Yes, economics, inflation, but a lot of cost, co community, etc. Not if you you are not likely to be voted out if there are more out of school children in your state, or more adult uh, illiterates, and so on. So I think there are issues here about federalism and governance, which people like Akshay probably have to go into. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, India, well, case of misplaced priorities perhaps for first, not being able to find their way for the first four decades after independence. It's only in 1968 with the first national policy that uh, one rejects the Gandhian basic education and moves on to 10-year education. Elitist orientation and the grip of caste, I think you only have to read the latest literature to see how uh, the situation has improved, but how uh, it is still uh, still very pretty bad, uh, and also huge emphasis on accessibility, enrollment, great pride in saying that you have a school within walking distance of a kilometer in rural areas. It is a great achievement, but is it enough? And also, it comes to the neglect of learning, retention, and completion in primary schools. Uh, soft state. Yeah, maybe. Why are we not able to handle issues of teacher absenteeism and child labor? And Myron Weiner again has, has a lot of issues there. And my, my take is, and, and uh, I think uh, Lan Pritchard is also uh, saying similar, I'm, I'm resonating unconsciously what he's saying is that there is an issue beyond education which has to be sorted out in India, and that is the issue of reform of public administration. Uh, there is no, no reason why, why you should have uh, such large educational districts when the number of schools, teachers and children have, have increased exponentially uh, in the last 60 years. Uh, is there a professional card of planners and managers to make decentralization work? Perhaps not. India decided, I don't know, reasons are not clear, the Indian, there is no Indian education service. And the question is, did, did we again miss a trick there? Because the education, teach, uh, the teachers and managers of education are subject to 
the general administrators who are not so sensitive to education, if I may say so. That includes myself. And blurred roles and responsibilities between the center and states. If you look at states like Brazil, Mexico, federal, China, there is a much clearer distinction between who should do what. For example, in China, headmasters of schools can be appointed by the district government. Teachers are all recruited by the county government. In India, this is done at a very highly centralized level. The question is why. And again, if you ask the National Ministry of Education, what are they doing, which is adding value to what the states are doing, the answers will be fuzzy. Not so clear. And the third level, the th third level which is now sought to be strengthened through community engagement, decentralization, the, the school management, the community is extremely weak. And so I talk about excessive centralization of educational management. And I feel that uh, you can't uh, achieve education if your headmasters and district officials are basically powerless and penniless. And so to the end, the policy formulation and implementation, how does it happen in China and India? My take on it is that uh, having been witness to two processes, both the processes, there are critical differences in process, content, implementation, and monitoring. In India, the consultation process was good. We were there in 86. It was before the internet, uh, so it had its limitations, but it was domestic. In China, it has been very much international and a willingness to learn from uh, OECD countries from countries like India and others. So it's a much more open, uh, and, and the openness is because they want to achieve those standards. Uh, India high on rhetoric and exhortations, uh, low on substance. <laughs> China very specific, concrete, detailed, with differentiated goals, targets, performance indicators. They're already doing this. And, and I think in China, they literally, uh, the verbiage is less and, and the, the, you know, the numbers and the targets are much more uh, visible. And it's now calibrated to international standards. 40 educational indicators of the new policy of which 20 are international. And India's program of action often drawn in top-down fashion without real budget estimates, whereas China rolls out plans and pilots very systematically in different regions, test them out, and then expands uh, following Deng Xiaoping's famous adage of feeling the stones while crossing a river. So if, this, if the so stones are not uh, are sharp and are pinching, they, they probably don't need to be replicated. But, uh, and then lastly, India has not yet launched a systematic, systematic review of the implementation after 20 years of the national policy. It is high time, I think, that they did so. So what you are seeing now is a lot of ad hoc interven uh, interventions by the ministers. Uh, class 10 exam is abolished. Uh, Three-year degree course is made into a four-year degree course. Uh, suddenly a semester is introduced without adequate preparation. So you, I think this, this is a lot to do with uh, not being able to come up with another national policy to address the serious issues. And there is, for those who are interested, some references. Thank you. Dhanyawad. Nihao. So um, I really must uh, thank, thank you for this very stimulating uh, you know, topic and, and uh, you know, your perspective and presentation. I think uh, what I'll do here is just maybe uh, outline a few questions just to stimulate the discussion. Uh, I think a lot of you will have questions. And uh, I want to point out just a few things. But before that, I want to just point out we'll probably end just a few minutes early. Um, I have to leave to catch a flight, but you're welcome to obviously stay and continue to ask questions until the very end at 1.30. So you know, a, lot of, a lot of issues come up here. Um, and it's almost so difficult to pinpoint what the cause is of the problem because it's just a laundry list of issues from uh, colonial legacy, constitutional legacy, to a skills mismatch within the bureaucracy and the task at hand, issues of regionalism, uh, problems of learning and politics. But I think a as a political scientist, and that's what I'm trained in, I'll just point out two questions that come up. Uh, so China's achievements, it seems, from the presentation, come out of a combination of a political vision and an effective organization to carry out that vision. And in, in politics, this is kind of the question of political will and capacity. 
So what does the state want to do and is it able to do it? And it seems China is able, A, able to decide very early on it wants to do this, expand education. And it's able also very quickly to develop the organizations that are capable of carrying it out. Meanwhile, India uh, lacks the will early on and the capacity, and it seems over time develops the will, but still lacks the capacity, the governance capacity. And this is education is one sector, but this can the same sort of problem can be, uh, you know, it can be repeated in the health sector, in the police. You take any public institution in India, and it's hard not to see it as virtually corroded from the inside out. And this raises a serious puzzle, because you you tend to think, and the conventional wisdom tends to be, that democracy is really uh, closely tied to education. For after all, people can vote. The masses can vote. And they can uh, make a claim on the state and hold officials accountable when they don't provide services and, and goods that they want. And yet the Chinese system almost seems more responsive to the demands of people, uh, more willing to engage with organizations on the ground and willing to work uh, across regional disparities, gender disparities, all these sorts of problems um, far more effectively than a democratic system, which is really interesting because the comparison between India and China so often that's made is about economic growth and, and military strength. And, yet, and then the political system seems to be where in India you find a lot of political leaders say, well, we're a democracy, right? We have human rights. And yet it seems to be that democracy is not doing terribly well in, uh, in, in realizing those rights on the ground. And uh, I think my question will be, um, to you, because uh, one thing that you didn't touch on, and uh, you know, you have extensive experience uh, with many of the key innovations that came out of India, actually, that you just kind of touched upon. Um, what happens to officials like you when you go in and you try to innovate? You uh, develop a, a project, a program, and uh, you know, you see that you know there is some political will early on, but then it doesn't sustain. What's causing that? What What are the pressures? that you've experienced when you've tried to make these changes and you've tried to almost be an entrepreneur within a system that doesn't necessarily reward that behavior. Um, so if you could say something a bit more about that, uh, what's the politics of innovation in India for a bureaucrat like yourself who's very you know, interested and willing to put in the effort into this? The second issue seems to be something dealing with the culture of learning. So it seems that from the, from the uh, presentation, China's willing to learn from other countries. Um, in fact, they're bringing you to China, apparently, that to learn. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure I, what lesson. I, I have to pass the test yet. <laughs> <laughs> not knowing Chinese. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, this tells you something about a, a political culture. Um, and uh, you know, we had a lunch uh, just prior, and you had mentioned that this is not the case in India. There's a defensiveness when one brings up counterexamples from other countries and so on and so forth. And so I wonder, why is this culture of learning not, not more prevalent in India? And, uh, you know, is it this just in education? Because I think about other sectors, like, say, telecom, where India has actually done remarkably well, uh, perhaps even more, more so than China. If you look at rural penetration of, of mobile phones and the regulation of of, of the telecom industry, barring some corruption scandals, of course. But I'm curious what you think. Is this, an in, is this something about mass education for the poor, where India does not see, the, or officials don't see the need? And are we back to the Myron Wiener story? That this is just about those who work with their minds, they get education, the elite, and those who work with their hands, you know, leave them to work on the farm. And so I'm, I'm going to end just with that question, and then uh, we'll open it up for, uh, for you to answer that, or you can you know, take questions from the audience. But I'll ask that the audience ask a question, ask one question, and so we can get more and more people to uh, uh, engage. So please. I think your questions are extremely valid and take me a long time to yes, so <laughs> get, get <laughs> my head around. And, like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it is possible for um, forward-looking and progressive individuals to still prosper in the Indian uh, system of governance. Mm. But uh, whether there are enough of those kind of people in sectors like education and health is, I think, the, the issue. Uh, and I think this uh, kind of internal uh, prioritization and categorization of uh, areas of work in the Indian mindset, bureaucratic, bureaucratic mindset, is, is the, I think, a fundamental issue. Uh, I was talking to you, uh, the senior most civil servants from, uh, from India 
want to be in the economic and financial industry. Um, I don't know whether that is the case in China or whether they have such a choice, but it is not the case in, in most industrialized countries. So there is a fundamental uh, mindset which has, which has to be changed. Uh, my wife will know about uh, uh, how I was kind of, um, my status was lowered in the family uh, and in the civil service because I persisted in working in education. And actually you are seen to be blocking your own career advancement to become chief secretary or cabinet secretary. So you have to really, um, you know, stay there. And if you stay there, you can do a lot of good things. Uh, and there is a group, I think, and we must pay tribute to, to the late Anil Bodia, uh, one of the great architects of the National Policy on Education and uh, the community-based programs. Uh, a group of us who were mentored and trained by people like him who stayed in education for most of their career, and I think we would like to say that we made a difference. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, but we, I don't know whether we were able to change the mindset. A lot of my friends uh, still think that um, it, until I joined UNESCO, I thought they thought I was no good. So uh, <laughs> that, that I think that there's some something has to happen to bring. Um, good people into education and the more I think about it, I think we in India we need an Indian education service, even now. Uh, without an Indian health service and without an Indian education service which has as much clout or even more than IAS and other services, generalist services, we are not going to be able to push these agendas beyond a point. And, and when you go in for decentralization, again there is an issue which is the wider issue which you've talked about, about innovation. Uh, Indian bureaucrats are extremely reluctant to hand over part of the people in the panchayats. And, and that is also strange because it's a democracy, as you say, and that's the way it should go. So you have the central government ministries, very well staffed, budgeted, powerful, at state government also. But below that, it stops at the district official, the collector and district magistrate, who actually has nothing to do substantively with education and health. The education and health people are in a much lower hierarchy of status, power, and uh, funding than, than the, 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 the generalist administrator. And I think the time has come to debunk this whole myth about specialization and generalization. How much of a generalist can you be? You, know? you have to have some sectoral specialization. You have to be able to work in certain sectors without being taught ABC. And then, of course, basically, I think, uh, speaking for the civil service, you can't be shunted out every one year. If people like us stayed in education, one could say, because nobody else wanted to come into education. But if you are in one of those coveted ministries, there's a huge competition, political and otherwise, and all kinds of tricks and of trade are used to get those so-called coveted positions. Uh, so, so there, there are huge problems. Uh, I, I can only touch. Willingness to learn is, is a huge issue. You know. I think uh, I, I said in India that one thing I've really learned from the Chinese is genuine humility. Uh, they, they, if you praise them, they, they actually instinctively bow their head and say, oh, we could do better in any, in any social or cultural situation. And, and Deng Xiaoping said it best, I think, when he advised the civil service and the political leadership to, to conceal excellence and to cultivate obscurity. I mean, I, I don't know of any other leader in the world who, <laughs> who would say that. <laughs> and now, I think if you, if you say China is militarily powerful, it throws its weight, that's a different issue. But when you meet Chinese individuals whom you work with, this, this does play out. We, I work with 40 Chinese day in, day out. We work with ministry officials. They, they know everything that they should know, and they don't boast about it. And in the, uh, this process of developing these educational indicators and the policy, they threw it all open. They asked UNESCO for advice, OECD, World Bank, ADB. It's not, it's not necessary that they will take the advice but they will look at it very carefully. So I used to say in India, the event is important, but in China, what you do after the event is more important because you take all the country reports, translate it into Chinese, and see what, what could apply. 
uh, India has kind of boxed itself in because we started on such a high note on 50s and 60s when other countries emulated us and we don't know how to step down, I think. And, and we have to. We have to say that we can learn from Thailand, from Indonesia, from Malaysia. And if you do it genuinely, I think it will make, make a huge difference. Well, that's just fascinating. So let's open it up to questions. Um, maybe we can take two or three at a time, and then you can field them. Yeah. So um, we'll start here, um, then here, and that's number three. And by the way, I yeah. think China is doing much better than India in telecom. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm corrected. <laughs> The penetration of internet and smartphones is mind-boggling. I have a booklet which I didn't bring with me, but I can, I can sure, share sure, some of sure. I mean, it's, it's not comparable. <laughs> I stand corrected. Please. I spent some time in both countries, and in my view, India purports to have a democracy, but it doesn't really. And China doesn't even purport to have a democracy. <laughs> so I was going to ask you, to what degree you feel your findings stem from the differences in these two political systems? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll take two or three questions and then. Well, thank you very much for your talk. I hope you enjoy the country. Yeah, totally um, I think one thing that um, I would like to comment upon is the prospect of social mobility when it comes to the motivation of the students to be educated themselves. You, you talked about the willingness, <coughs> the willingness to learn at the policy level, at the government level, but also I think uh, on the other hand, we have to. Uh, look at the other side of the policy implementation and look at the children. Um, I always think about this because in the past five summers I've been working in the Chinese countryside in uh, rural secondary school um, places and there have been a lot of dropouts solely because those students of 14, 15 year olds and their parents cannot see the prospect of social advancement because of education. And, um, and this has been worsening because of the consolidation of stratification in, in China as the, the, the economic progress goes on and on. Um, I was just thinking the social mobility issue might be something that plays into this uh, question of why there is a disparity between these two societies uh, in, in, in terms of literacy. Um, because I think if we even look at the United States, where I think there is a prevalent culture of people believing that um, education and college education can lead to a, uh, upper social mobility and, and social advancement. Still, when we look at African American uh, communities, I, I don't think there is as much optimism on this issue as there is uh, among other groups of, um, of, uh, of, of people. And I think uh, there is something universal in this, that if people do not really see the prospect of social mobility, uh, they're not as willing to put their resources onto their children's education and things like that. And, and this might be one of the reasons that I was just proposing for, uh, to, to, to explain India's uh, low uh, literacy rate. And also maybe also a, a lack of a history of social revolution might also play into this picture. Mm -hmm. And we had one more question here. Yeah, this is all great questions. Yes. <laughs> Uh, do these children, what, what do these children get? Uh, are, do we know who they are? Would it be possible for state resources to be focused on them, give them laptops or whatever, connect them to something? Okay, thanks. I don't know how to look in front and answer the questions <laughs> at the back. I've never confronted the situation before. It's quite undemocratic, but... <laughs> Uh, political systems, yeah. Mm. I finally don't believe that it matters that much. <laughs> because the problem with... I, I made two presentations in the last two years in India on, on China, only on China. Because in, in India, if I compare China and India, I'll, I, I'll be in great difficulty. Uh, so, uh, I concentrated on China and the response two years later was better than the first. Because time, it takes time to sink into to the Indians that there is something more than the political system at work here. And uh, as you see, I, I think, I don't know whether you have uh, had a chance to look at, I believe it has not yet been released, the Uncertain Glory, uh, Dress and Sense it's, book. It's it has been, yeah. Now, that, their take on this is that there is 
uh, a kind of dysfunctionality in the India's education and health system which is uh, uh, peculiar to India. Now, I, I don't buy that as well because I, I think India has uh, used this uh, argument of exceptionalism for too long. Uh, and and uh, I think as far as providing education to children and making adult, illiter adult illiterates literate and giving them a chance, I think all political systems should be committed to that. So I think that Indian, uh, India is using this quite cleverly as an alibi. But I think the time is up. Because if you, if you look at uh, the uh, devastating critique, if I may say so, of San Andres across any parameter, in health and education. They compare India with South Asia, India not faring well now. It used to be top of the six South Asian countries. Now it is at the bottom according to them, uh, the statistics with, with as they say, trouble torn Pakistan, keeping company with them. Secondly, there is no comparison at all between South Asia and Southeast Asia. And you have mix of political systems, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, even Laos, Vietnam, Northeast Asia, where I work, all of them 95% and above literacy. So, so I think you've reached a point where no excuses now. <laughs> uh, whatever political system you choose has not been imposed. You, I mean, you can complain about colonialism, but now you, you've chosen your own constitution, you've chosen your own system. The federal system, uh, uh, whether it works or not, is your responsibility to make it work. Change it if it doesn't work. But get 300 million people out of adult illiteracy in 10 years, otherwise I think you are in deep trouble. Get all children to school and make sure they learn for at least five years, particularly girls and the lower caste. There are no excuses. Schools have to function properly. Teachers have to be present. Uh, communities have to be involved. And this has been, uh, what I'm saying, has been done on many small scale projects in India. A lot of them with partnership with civil society. I think that if you ask me to point one f finger to two great advantages of India, what is the civil society and what they are doing uh, to fill in the gaps which the state is leaving. And the second is the potential of private sector, which actually contrary to a lot of uh, people's beliefs has been very active in education since, the very, since centuries. So, so I think that uh, if the state cannot do it all in India, which is quite obvious it can't now, it will have to expand partnerships with private sector and with civil society. And I think make the federal system work. You can't have a system where you have a gap of 50 percentage points between states who are doing better and those who are not. I mean, in any kind of political system that is inexcusable. Pardon? Unless you're the US. <laughs> so yes, I think US and India are keeping a bit of company these days. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, on this issue of motivation to learn, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I think in India we always said, you know, vertical mobility, social mobility uh, is, is, uh, is really something that uh, cannot be quantified but is one of the motives why you ought to be, an edu uh, you ought to be educated or literate. In China they did it somewhat uh, a Chinese uh, UNESCO colleague studied Chinese adult uh, literacy for some years and she said that one of the answers that people why do you want to become literate they say we want to become rich. Now that is another way of saying we don't want to remain poor. So I think this is a brilliant psychological ploy by the leadership of China saying that if you want, don't want to remain poor avail of the opportunities uh, the right and the obligation. If you don't do it, we are going to do it for you. So I, I think this uh, psychological move, in, in India still the, the link between eradication of poverty and literacy is not so strong, even in policy articulation. So I think that in UNESCO also, I feel that the UN also doesn't, um, doesn't do it as well as it should. We have a lot of examples saying what a year of primary education will do in terms of agricultural productivity, and learning and so on and so uh, industrial productivity but we 
are not able to convince ministries of finance and ministries of planning, people like us who are in education, of really saying that if you want economic growth and less poverty, you have to have education. That link, uh, I think, has to be developed and uh, there should be, should be more research, uh, research on this. The, uh, the barriers to um, uh, what you're saying, I think hukou and gaukou in China, those, if, unless you hand, handle those well, I think this, uh, the barriers to motivation will remain. Chinese are looking into that and trying to reform that uh, through this uh, 250 million migration and migrant education is being taken care of in a way that it isn't in India and other developing countries. But um, yeah, that's a big issue. And then you have the issue of left behind children. What, what happens to you if you are left behind in the rural area? Uh, so I fully agree with you that a lot of children are frustrated. My wife and I were down in Xi'an and, and I think we were speaking to this group of children as to uh, why examinations are not the be all and end all of life. But it, the atmosphere is so competitive, so intense that one of those girls broke down and cried when we said that, you know, you may be the best artist in the world. So what if you didn't make it to Gaokao, you know? So there are issues, I agree with you, and, and they, they have, to be, uh, have to be resolved. NFE, um, yeah, I think India, again, stop and start, ad hoc weak uh, commitment of the elite to NFE. You know, on one hand, elite would stand back and say, so the, ol the only thing you've got for the poor children is non-formal education. Why don't you send their ch your children to them? And then they will not support non-formal education, you know, saying that. But we went to the Barefoot College, those who haven't should go as a development model of uh, civil society by Bunker Roy near, near Jaipur. And, and we studied uh, three non-formal education schools in, in the pitch of night. And we had a Hong Kong professor who took me there every day saying, I'm not convinced of this model. And it was pitch dark, but a large number of younger, young girls were coming um, to learn between 8 and 10 p.m. And they were learning. And we met alumni and graduates from that parallel system, which was uh, badly underfunded and support, uh, not so supported by the system. But uh, it still persists. And, uh, uh, one of the girls then, if you, if you uh, Google, I think, Mark Mason's article from Hong Kong, Hong Kong University on why this girl uh, comes to school at, only at 8 p.m., it's fascinating because she gets up at 4 a.m. and does not have a free minute till 8 p.m. So that's the only opportunity she gets. But my question is, if that is the issue, that is the state of development of India's agrarian society and rural society, then why should they learn in darkness? Uh, through one teacher who is trained, uh, who is more motivated than trained and with uh, insufficient learning material, then that should become a part of a parallel system like in Thailand, where if you go outside Bangkok, you find a whole lot of schools and colleges glittering as if it was middle of the day and number of people studying there. So make it into a parallel system, have the courage to say that we have to do it, otherwise these children will not get a second chance and then be able to integrate them into the system when, when there is time through equivalency, certification, etc. What's the translation of those two phrases you used? Which ones? Hukou. Hukou. Hukou is the residence permit where, uh, you know, your destiny is almost dependent on where you're born. And um, Gaokou is the college entrance exam, which is taken by 10 million students every year. They now say it's easier to get into Harvard than to get to go. We'll start here with Arun, two and three. <coughs> so, uh, thank you very much for the comparison. Um, uh, if you look at the history of reform in China in the last 40, 50 years, a lot of the things that we now uh, think are useful in explaining X or Y about China's success started as very small experiments, in particular township, villages, whatever. Uh, and then there was a scale-up process. So my question about India is, do you think that we have inadequate experimentation? Uh, ultimately, perhaps because of the constraints that you mentioned, the bureaucracy, lack of specialization, lack of tenure, bureaucrats, and appropriate local areas. Or is it that there's inadequate scale-up once something successful does happen? Um, because those two have sort of different policy policy implications. I think. That's the question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, 
I stay in the international education policy and talk about this with education. So actually in my class I'm working with the UNICEF um, China officer um, to deal with its leadership challenges in the education programs in China. My sense is that yes indeed in China the political will to um, to implement the education reform is very, very strong and governments and academia are looking very actively at global as practices and international models. But there are still um, significant ga gaps that remain between research, policy research and policy implementation. For example, we import a lot of international models, but how to translate them into the local context and make them truly adaptable to um, the local schools and students. And another issue is that there are still cultural and political barriers to mobilize the resources of domestic or national um, teams and international partners. Uh, for UNICEF, uh, to my knowledge, is that it's particularly difficult for them to reach uh, more national ex expertise because they, well, it's off the record, but they are only allowed to get in contact with uh, certain partners and universities that the government recommend or rather assign them to. Do you feel that the same leadership challenges are faced by UNESCO in China or India or other places? Third question. Uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in what you think about the role of technology in this set of problems. Um, I'm, I've been involved in four big projects around the redesign of learning, basically. Or schooling, the relationship between schooling and learning. Mexico, the Middle East, um, and uh, one coming up in China. And what uh, impresses me about the, the terms and conditions under which the, the, uh, the charge is placed is that technology is very central to the, pro to the, to the redesign process that people talk about. And it's especially around issues of quality and access accessibility. Uh, that uh, we now have the capability do this thing called blended learning in which students get access to the highest quality uh, content and curriculum through technology and then a more immediate learning environment reinforced by adults. Then we have this wild and crazy stuff that's been going on with Sugata Mitra's work, which was totally without teachers. Unmediated where the actual content-based assessments suggest that up to a certain level, kids with no community or family resources can uh, basically engage in learning that gets them to a relatively high level uh, without any adult mediation at all. Uh, and uh, it strikes me that the scale of these issues is so huge that uh, to talk about them in the absence of technology is to, is to sort of, uh, I mean, it just doesn't acknowledge the, the realities. Uh, and I think to some extent, since all of the projects I'm working on have been endorsed or are being funded by, public uh, agencies, I think they're beginning to understand the possibility that we could fundamentally change the technology of the sector. So you want to uh, take this? Yeah, yeah. Um, all, all great questions. Uh, I think India has a lot of experimentation, mainly um, uh, supported by civil society, but if you, it, it's a, it's a, again, like everything in India, a rather contradictory and confusing situation. If you look at some of the major national initiatives in India over the last 25 years, let's say in education, uh, a number of them were, uh, came from successful uh, initiatives in the states. Uh, the first open university in India is Andhra Pradesh Open University. The national open university in India is modeled on that. The first open school in India is the Delhi Open School. 
which has been upgraded into a National Institute of Open Learning. The midday meal scheme was initiated by Tamil Nadu. The employment guarantee scheme, which is a name for a, non a national non-formal education, was initiated by Madhya Pradesh. So there, there is that one, one part where, where the center seems to be learning from the states. Uh, the other part is uh, whether the states are learning from each other, and that I think is pretty weak. And the national government has to really uh, be able to see how uh, innovations and experiments in different states, despite difference of context um, uh, and language and culture in India, most importantly, can still be usefully disseminated uh, to, the, to the other states. Uh, and I think the mainstreaming of successful innovations is the area where uh, we are very weak. These, the programs that we mentioned, Lok Jumbish, which is people's mobilization of education, Shiksha Karmi, uh, using uh, social activists as para teachers, Jan Shala, almost handing over the schools to the community, all had generally positive results, supported by international assistance and monitored and evaluated systematically. But when those projects have disappeared, uh, I think mostly people go back to square one. So I think that uh, if, if I were to conceptualize these programs, I would probably pay much more attention to what will happen after the program pro project disappears. That step-by-step -step approach that you were referring to, which China follows, in rolling out pilots and then learning from those pilots and adapting it uh, and uh, upscaling it or rejecting it is not part of the India, Indian psyche yet. And I think the other weakness is that this uh, uh, MN, culture of M&E is really lacking. Unless you have much more rigorous monitoring and evaluation of schemes like midday meals or Operation Blackboard or whatever the major national schemes, people are afraid of failure and therefore afraid of evaluation. Uh, China has evaluated with us, UNESCO, I think, are coming to your question. Uh, in five provinces which have difficulties in implementing education for all, China has partnered with UNESCO to monitor and evaluate performance and challenges in five states. That kind of openness and willingness to learn again uh, is there. So I, I think we need, uh, we need really in India to look at how you mainstream and how you uh, do this M&E more systematically and that evaluation really brings out more success than failure. Uh, one of the examples is I was saying to people in India, so 25 years since 1986 in 2011, why not have a, a evaluation uh, of the NPE after 25 years and people said, oh, you're asking for a post-mortem of a and I said, you know, I can give you 10 uh, achievements uh, just like that, uh, which we can be proud of because of the 86 policy. But somehow this psychology is, is, uh, is pervasive. <coughs> and I think there are very few examples of scaling up from, from community-based uh, experiments which have made schools functional at low cost. Th that is where the rub is. You know. How do you make the teachers come to school and teach and... Uh, have better achievement and a lot of it is because communities are, are engaged in, in the whole process and that is accepted. Uh, so again it comes to that reluctance to decentralize genuinely. Uh, they'll say okay the community can do all this but we don't have funds for it. So that's, that's a non-start. Uh, yeah, I, I, there are, uh, what you say we, we, we talk, for just to talk, talk about the migrants five years ago when we said that there are serious problems in China's educating the urban migrants, China said we don't want international agencies to talk about it, that's our, our business. So in, in the international agencies, we, we push some of these boundaries, you know. Now uh, we pushed my education of migrants, uh, we took it up as a joint UN project, we talked about youth. Um, education and migrants, it made a difference and now uh, in China it is part of a mainstream policy. Uh, the other difficult part is ethnic minorities. The policy and practice is quite at variance. The policy is that they should have education which is bilingual and suited to their cultural needs and so on. And then you have a local official saying that we will not offer classes in Tibetan. 
so we are trying to push that boundary as well. And I think there are, as you say, psychological and historical issues because Chinese tend to view ethnic minorities as nationalities. Nationalities are good until they play the game and are integrated with the state and don't cause trouble. But they are not if they do. And historically, they have, they have caused a lot of trouble. So there are some psychological issues there where we are trying to convince them that uh, the education of uh, minorities has to be paid, uh, paid more attention to. Your point about technology, of course, I, I kept thinking to myself, can I make this presentation without mentioning ICTs? And then for sake of time and compatibility, somehow I took out that slide. But of course, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is, I think, uh, a way to leapfrog a lot of these problems. And, and the more uh, sensibly we use uh, the potential and harness it to the needs of what you were saying, the disadvantaged children, uh, the better it will be. Uh, we in UNESCO in China are working with Microsoft, with Apple and so on uh, to develop uh, smartphone applications. For example, for teachers who work in isolation and have problems in science and mathematics which are not being uh, you know, so, uh, sorted out. We, we, we very much support open and distance learning. Now the difference, since we are talking about China and India, I find there are a couple of differences. One is of course the penetration in China is very deep and it is in the same language. In India, every state will have to find a solution. Yeah. You don't see so many people using smartphones because of the language issue. Uh, <clears throat> and, and you have to have, uh, you know, uh, UNESCO has a scheme, you know, using cyberspace for, for um, using, uh, you know, diversifying languages in education. So I think we, uh, we'll have to invest in that because people are not going to be able to, even TV channels uh, in India, it's, it, now you have a TV channel in, many TV channels in each language. And uh, when there was this use of the subtitles of, of popular movie music to, to help people learn letters, it helped because there was so much of uh, availability of learning material in different languages, which could be used on TV and radio. I think that stage has probably not come in computers and mobiles, my understanding is. Of course, also I think that these, uh, you know, very, um, Again, simple bureaucratic solutions. You have a problem, we'll give you 100 computers. You know. No power, uh, <clears throat> no electricity, nobody knows what to do with those. So too many failed examples of uh, right. use of technology. Right. Exactly. I think... Million tablets. They're giving out over the next three years 25 million tablets and 10 million mobile phones. Who? Who? Yeah, the yeah. yeah so well, that's the that's. I think Samajwadi Party. They, really you know, this is a this, yeah. populism so, gone mad. I think this is know. getting back to your point about ribbon cutting and events, right? Yeah, and the aftermath yeah. and sustainability and. The, I think all those students will sell right. those laptops right. because right. yeah, because, actually, because they're hungry. I, actually, it's interesting you point that out. Um, I was reading some of those laptops, and I, I wrote an op-ed on this. Um, it, it opens up with a, a welcome screen that shows the face of the chief minister and the political party, and it can be removed. So uh, <laughs> it's, that's it, something it, it, Ch China can learn there, from. There, there, there's your, uh, you know, your basic democracy. So let's, let, let, let's end with one final question. Uh, you've been waiting. Yes, uh, yes uh, thank you for the uh, comparison between China and India. When I was, uh, you know, reading the slides, you know, I, I found a very big uh, difference, you know. I think uh, 50 years ago, I think perhaps education in China and India, you know, they were both gender issues. But, you know, now, 50 years later, you have seen the biggest progress in China is the closing of the gender gap. But this gender gap remains a huge issue in India. Perhaps I would say, you know, the education issue in India is a gender issue. And so uh, I just wonder, you know, uh, but you know, if you look at women's status in general, in China and India, uh, I do research on gender in China. So we know, despite all the criticism, I think we have seen quite a lot of improvement <coughs> in women's status in China. But you know, I, I'm not familiar with the Indian scene, but from the news, uh, you know, paper reports, you know, all these media reports, you know, I have the impression that you know, the women's status in China, uh, in India, has to, you know, hasn't changed much or hasn't improved much. You know, for example, the sexual you know, violence issue is 
totally, you know, appall it. So I'm just wondering, you know, whether um, this, you know, big difference between India and China is really about the changing or the different pace of improvement in women's status. And I think I can imagine, you know, this uh, low status of women will impact on parents' you know, motivation to invest in the you know, girls' and daughters' education, low level you know, teachers, you know, the interaction with female pupils, you know, the expectation of them, and local officials, you know, the political view, you know, in investing or improving, you know, uh, you know, to uh, the education because maybe you know they have this mindset it's a about women and at the end of the day they will get married and they stay at home so why should we be bothered so it's not about it's, you know that you have those who have the brain who will work and you have those who don't have the brain who do the farming it's really about men will do the work and women will stay at home and they don't need education you you said it you said it all. Yeah, so, uh, this is more of a statement than a question. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I agree with all that you say. Uh, yeah. Huge neglect of education of girls and women in India, uh, starting <clears throat> from um, pre-independence, the scriptures and so on. Very complicated issue. Obviously, we can do much better. Some very successful initiatives like uh, Mahila Samakya, which is empowerment of of women. And then through all these externally assisted projects, for example, we were work, working with CEDA and CEDA, I owe it to CEDA to become, be, they become more gender sensitive, you know. So I think this, again, this openness to learn, uh, I think India should be looking a lot at China. Uh, Mao, Mao said that women hold up half the sky. I also had that, you know, the right statement at the right time makes a difference. He said that women can do anything that men can do. Now that's put crudely. But it did help and and also the one child policy has helped uh, you know because if you have one child whether it's a boy or a girl you're going to uh, educate it so i think the size of the families also makes a difference but definitely uh, india's agenda has to be uh, very much focused on the education of women and girls but i'll just tell you a short anecdote when i was doing some research in rajasthan which is awfully conservative you know, I, I don't think China probably had this, maybe it did, but in India there has been denial of access to education for girls and the lower castes as a policy, as a thought, as a, something that is, a, that they, are, they do not deserve access to education. So there is this story, you know, we have these district gazetteers in, in, in Rajasthan of a Jodhpur mm. a re, a resident, you know, the principalities used to have British residents just to see that they are not being too naughty. And uh, the British resident decided to take it upon himself to visit the schools of a city called Jodhpur, which is very famous now. Uh, it's, it, you could say it is the capital of Western Rajasthan. And he visited school after school one day and did not find in the early 40s a single girl in the whole city of Jodhpur in any school at any level. And so the next day he went to homes and with great difficulty was able to pick up a group of two or three girls and admit himself as the resident senior most administrator them to education. So you're starting at that kind of level. And, and so progress, if it is relative, it's good. But if it's comparative to China, no, no comparison really. China has done much, much better. And on that <coughs> note, uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. If, if anyone wants to discuss any issue over coffee, I'm, I'm willing to do there, that. There's, as well. a, there's an open invitation <laughs> for coffee.